Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today we're gonna to be doing a review and walkthrough of this game here, Concordia by Rio Grande Games. Concordia is a wonderful game for two to five players that has those players taking on the role of trade merchants spreading out from the city of Roma and across the Roman Empire, attempting to produce trade routes and build storehouses in the various cities and provinces across the empire. This is a lovely Euro slash German style game that's based heavily around commerce and trade and has players purchasing goods and selling goods in an effort to sort of appease six different Roman gods, which will contribute to victory points at the end of the game depending on how well you pleased those gods. Um, so getting into what comes with the game, we have this very large board here that is a double-sided board. It's got a map on either side. On one side, you've got the Roman Empire, relatively large, includes most of Europe, mid and southern Europe, northern Africa, western Asia, the entire Mediterranean area. On the other side, you have a slightly more zoomed in board specifically on Italy. Uh, that's because on this larger side, you can play with three to five players. And on the smaller Italian side, you can play with two to four players. Now, when I say smaller, I don't mean it takes up any less of the board. I just mean it's zoomed in, therefore it has fewer places to work with. And so it works for a smaller group of people. Um, moving on from what's just on the map, you also have a victory point track around the outside of the board. You have these bonus region spaces here. I'll get into what those are for. And you have some card spaces for personality cards, which can be purchased throughout the game. They're kind of upgrade cards, and we'll touch on that. Moving on to the tokens and the different pieces and cards of the game. Uh, we've got a lot of wooden tokens in this game, which is nice. All of the player tokens, which are representing these uh, landfaring colonists, the seafaring colonists, the different storehouses that you can build, and your victory point tracker are in your player color, as are your starting hand for player cards. The colors are uh, yellow, black, blue, red, and green, uh, and also your player board. Um, for other wooden tokens, you also have the goods tokens or the, the resource tokens, the, the product tokens. Um, those are anvils for tools, uh, stocks of grain for food, vases or vases for wine, uh, little uh, qu squares of cloth for cloth, and little brown bricks for bricks. Um, moving on from the nice wooden tokens to some slightly less nice but still quality cardboard tokens, we've got money or sisterti as it's referred to in, I guess, Roman. Um, that is in denominations of one, two, Two, five, and 10. You've got these bonus tiles here for the different region bonuses that you can activate during the game. And you have these city tiles here, which show the different types of cities that will be scattered semi-randomly across the map at the beginning of the game that produce different types of goods. Uh, for player boards, we've got double-sided player boards, again, matching your player color. On one side, it's got your storehouses, which are where your goods are held, and it also shows the cost to buy or sell goods, um, which doesn't vary throughout the course of the game, whether you're buying or selling. Um, and then on the other side, it shows you your individual player setup, which doesn't vary from player to player other than the amount of money you start with. Um, for cards, we've got the actual personality cards. Those are the upgrade cards you can purchase throughout the game. Uh, those are numbered one through five because you're gonna remove the ones with more than the number of players you have. So if you're playing in a three player game, you would remove the fours and fives. You've got your starting player hands, which is sort of like a small deck, but you're holding it all, so it's more of a hand. Um, and that is again, color coded to match your player color. You have these player reference cards, uh, one for each player. Those show the cost to build in a certain type of city for your storehouses and all also how the different gods score victory points at the end of the game. You've got this Concordia card here. That's gonna be a bonus that goes to the person who ends the game. And you've got this Perfectus Magnus card here. That's sort of a bonus ability that moves around the table throughout the course of the game so that every player gets a chance to utilize it. For rule books uh, or rule book, uh, it's much simpler than my most recent review, Root, uh, which had an entire skew of rule books and references. This game has one single sheet of legal paper, 11 by 17, also known as, I believe, A4 paper, printed on both sides and folded in half. And that's not even including the fact that it has several example sections that you don't necessarily need to read and lots of pictures. So really it's more like one single side of a piece of A4 paper. Other than that, you've also got this double-sided piece of sort of thin card stock here. Uh, that's how you set up the map and the game. But this is actually printed on one side in English and one side, I believe, in German. So really, it's only a single-sided printed piece of paper, which means really the total rules for this game are about three pages long. Uh, on top of that, you've actually got a nifty historical pamphlet that explains why the different regions and cities on this map are labeled the way that they are, because they're meant to represent Rome 
as it was 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire. And if you want to know what those cities became by, by modern name, or what countries they're now a part of, or what their cultures were like at the time and how they became part of the Roman Empire, that's all in that pamphlet. So a little bit of historical, educational vibes going on there. That's pretty cool. Um, moving on to how do you set the game up? Starting with each player's individual player board, you're going to flip it to the player board side. You're going to place one of each goods type onto that board. So one wine, one food, one tool, one cloth, and one brick. And it doesn't matter where you place them because as long as each one takes up one spot, that's all that matters. Um, you're also going to place two of each of your um, your colonists. So you have land faring and you have sea faring, which are represented by little people and little ships. You're going to place two ships and two people onto your board, and you're going to place the remaining one of each type onto the city Roma, because that's where everybody starts. Now, this can get a little annoying because Roma isn't big enough to fit four or five players worth of pieces. Considering your land faring and your sea faring pieces start there, you're going to end up with a total of eight or 10 pieces trying to fit onto this one city. But just do your best to get them on there. Once everybody starts spreading out, it won't be an issue anymore. Um, each player is also going to gain some money. The first player gains five, second player starts with two, third player starts with three. Sorry, I'm saying that wrong. First player starts with five, second player starts with six, third player starts with seven. It increases one per player going clockwise around the table. Um, lastly, the player to the right of the starting player is going to get the Prefectus Magnus card. That starts with them and moves counterclockwise each time it gets utilized. So once a player utilizes that special ability, it slides to the player to their right. So while player turn is going clockwise around the table, the Prefectus Magnus special ability is going counterclockwise around the table as it's being used. Each player is also going to receive one reference card, and the players are now good to go. Setting the board up, you're going to choose which side you want to use. Again, the ancient Rome side is for three to five players. The zoomed in Italian side is for two to four, and that's just because there's slightly less room on the ancient, uh, sorry, on the Italian side. Um, you're going to start by randomizing all of the city pieces, the city tiles here. If you flip them over, you'll see that other than the goods that they produce on the back side, they are lettered A, B, C, or D. On the board, you're going to see that all of the cities are lettered A, B, C, or D, except on the Italian side, there is no D. It's just A, B, and C. You're going to randomly place the city tiles matching letter to letter. So that's semi-randomized because you still have to put letter to letter, so there is some control over what can go where, but within sort of a section, things get randomized, so lots of replayability there. Um, once you have them all on the board, flip them all over, and you're now going to see what cities produce what goods in a certain region. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to assign the bonus tiles to the region spaces in the top left corner of the board. Now, those are based off of the most valuable good that any city in a region produces. So if you look at Gallia, for example, Gallia has three cities in it. Say those cities produce food, tools, and cloth. Out of those three goods, cloth is the most valuable, and I'm basing this off, off of the value on your player board. So food is worth four, tools are worth five, cloth is worth seven. So the most valuable good in that region is cloth. So the bonus for that region is going to be cloth. It's based off of the most valuable good that that region produces. So you're going to take a cloth bonus tile and you're going to place it next to Gallia on the upper left corner on the bonus sections for the different regions. After you've done that for all of the regions, you're lastly going to shuffle up the uh, personality cards. Again, not mixing the individual sections. So you shuffle all the ones together, then you shuffle all the twos together, then you shuffle all the threes together. You don't mix the individual sections. And then you stack them into a deck with ones on top, twos below that, threes below that, based off the number of players that you have. So again, semi-randomized because it's still held into sections, but each section is shuffled. You're gonna place that off to the side of the card spaces on the board, and you're going to flip one card out onto each space on the board. Those cards can be purchased throughout the course of the game, and I'll get into that. So we now have the board set up. All of uh, the players starting colonists are in Roma. We've got the randomized city tiles. We've got the uh, resource bonuses based off of the city tiles, and we've got our personality cards spread out and our personality deck ready to go. Each player has their starting goods, one of each. Their available bonus colonists, two of each type. Um, they're starting money and their reference card. The player to the right of the starting player has the Perfectus Magnus card, and we're ready to start. So, starting with the first player, each player is going to be playing one card from their starting hand. Now, every player starts with their entire hand, all of their cards picked up, and each player starts with the exact same cards. So these are basically the actions available to you. And because the actions are described almost entirely in detail on the cards, you don't really have to learn the additional rules other than a few minor sort of um, requirements or restrictions to things like movement and building. 
So let's start with the Architect card. The Architect card says you can move your colonists, and then you can build on any city that any of your colonists are adjacent to. So how many times do you get to move your colonists? It's based off the number of colonists you have. So everybody starts with two, one ship and one, uh, one land fairing and one sea fairing, one walking guy and one sailing guy. Um, so that would be a total of two moves because you have two colonists. You can either do two moves for a single piece or spread them as you choose, so one move a piece. If you had four colonists on the board, you'd have a total of four moves and you can do one piece four times or one piece three and another piece one or two pieces two each or four pieces one each, however you want to spread it. Um, but it's based off the number of colonists that you have. When you move, you don't move from city to city, even though you start in Roma. Once you leave Roma, you're only going to move on segments between cities. So you would move from one segment to another, hopping over the city, whether it be on land or sea. When you stop, you're going to stop on a segment in between two cities, again, once you leave Roma. So you're always going to be at the end of movement adjacent to two cities once you leave Roma. Um, the only penalty or the only restriction to this is that you can't stop on a segment that already has a colonist on it, whether it's yours or another player's. Now you can still move through that segment and you count it normally as you move through it as one and keep going, but you can't stop there. So it is technically possible to get in the way of other players or block them from moving in a certain direction because you might realize that because they can't stop in that same segment of you, that hinders them enough that they're now gonna have to go another way or in a different direction. You probably aren't gonna hang out there for long, so you're never gonna permanently lock down a section of the map. That would be a little silly and you'll get that once you play the game. Um, but you could be annoying for a little while. And that's why I say this is more of a Euro German style game because you can't really conflict your opponent. You can't really impact their gameplay that much. And as you're going to see, in many ways, you're actually going to benefit them, even though you don't necessarily want to. You don't really have any control over that. That's how the game is designed. So you do your movement, and then you can build in any city that any of your colonists, whether or not you just moved them, is adjacent to. How do you build? Well, the cost of building is on your reference sheet. So to build, for example, in a brick producing city, it costs one food and one money. Again, money is sesterity in this game because that's what Romans called it. Um, if you wanted to build in a wine producing city, it's one food, one, sorry, one brick, one wine, and four money. So it varies based off the city you're building in. Now, the only other thing that can impact this is if you're building in a city that already has another player's house on it. You have to multiply the amount of money not the amount of goods, the amount of goods never changes, but the amount of money that you have to pay, uh, pay to build based off of the number of houses that are already there. So if you are adding the second house to a, a city, you have to multiply the amount of money you pay to build there by two. If you're adding a third house, you know, there are already two other players that have houses there, you have to triple the amount of money that you pay and so on. The amount of goods never shifts. So that's architect, that's moving and that's building. Moving on to the Mercator card. This is how you are mostly going to shift around your goods and convert goods into money and vice versa. The first thing that happens is you gain three money from the bank, just straight up. The second thing is you can buy or sell two items. So, or buy and or sell. So you can buy two things, you can sell two things, or you can buy one and sell one in either or, your choice. Uh, the sell and buy value is the same and is listed across the top of the board. So bricks are worth three, food is worth four, tools are worth five, wine is worth six, cloth is worth seven. So this is how you can do some conversion between goods and money and back and forth. Uh, that's the Mercator card. Moving on to the Prefect card, which everybody starts with two of. The Prefect card has two parts. You choose one or the other. The first part is choose one region bonus tile that has not yet been activated and flip it over. You're going to gain the good that is shown on, si on the token that you just flipped. So if, for example, Syria shows cloth and you flip it over, you're going to gain a cloth. Now, if you currently have the Prefectus Magnus card, you're actually going to gain two of whatever good is shown there when you flip it over. And then you'll pass the card to the player to your right. The other part of this, and this is where you get into the give and take where you kind of have to benefit other players even if you don't want to, is that when you flip that token over, say again, for example, cloth in Syria, and you gain a cloth, you're also going to cause every storehouse that is built in any of the cities in Syria to pump out one good that that city produces. So even if you don't own those houses, or even if there are no houses built there, but even if you don't own those houses and other players do, you're gonna end up giving them resources because all of their houses in Syria are gonna spit out one good of the type of city that they're built on. So you're going to end up benefiting other players while you try to benefit yourself. Interesting. Uh, the other half of the Prefect card is that you can turn all of those tiles that have been flipped 
back over to their active, their, their available side. Now, when you flip these tiles over from their goods side to the back side, you'll notice they have coins printed on them, either one or two. When you flip them back, you're going to add up the total number of coins visible prior to the flip and gain that much money from the bank. Again, this is a give and take because you're getting a bunch of money from the bank, which is great, but you're also making all of those tiles available again for other players to activate with their prefect cards, which might be more beneficial for them. So you can't really help yourself without helping others. Moving on from the two Prefect cards, we have the Senator card. The Senator card is how you're going to acquire new and better or different cards from the row of cards, the personality cards available on the board. Now, you can purchase up to two, and I should say all of these cards have the up to or may words printed on them. So any of these cards are entirely optional once you play them. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to. You don't have to do anything at all. You can just play the card and say, pass. That's perfectly fine. And there's a reason why you might do that, and I'll touch on that in a minute. So you play the Senator card, you can purchase up to two cards from the row. What do they cost? They cost goods, not money. So goods that you have in your storehouse. There'll be a cost printed on each card in a red bar. It might be some wine, it might be a brick and a food, it might be some tools or any combination of those. Um, and there might also be an additional cost which will be printed on the board below the card. It might be any random resource, it might be some cloth, it might be two cloth, which is quite a bit considering cloth is worth seven money a piece. And the thing about that is the additional cost on the board gets less as the cards slide towards the left. So anytime a card is purchased, the remaining cards slide over to fill in its space and new cards are flipped off of the deck at the end of the row. So cards begin with quite an additional cost to them, but as other cards are purchased, they'll slide towards the cheaper end of the row, making them more, avail making them more sort of efficient to buy. But if you wait too long, another player might grab it before you do and now you've lost out on your opportunity. The cards that are going to show up in this row have sort of three different possible uh, forms that they can take. It might be a flat out duplicate of a card you already have, for example, another architect card that works in the exact same way, but allows you to do it more than once. It might be a better version of a card that you already have, for example, a Mercator that gives you five money and that lets you buy and sell two things instead of two money, or sorry, three money, and lets you buy or sell two things. Um, or it might be an entirely new card. For example, a console allows you to gain a card from the board without having to pay the cost printed on the board only the red bar, but it's one card instead of two, like the Senator offers, but makes you pay the cost on the board. So it's a varied version. So those are the different things that you can gain from the personality cards row. The last card that you can do that actually does something um, is the Diplomat card. The Diplomat card says that you can copy the top card of any other player's discard pile. As you can see, while I've been playing these, I've been putting them into a face-up discard pile in front of me. Each player will have a discard pile in front of them, and when you play the Diplomat, you can copy the top card off of any of their discard piles other than the Diplomat. So say, for example, you've already played your Mercator, but you'd love to do Mercator again because you have a plan that sort of requires it, and you don't want to pick your cards up yet, and another player has a Mercator sitting on top of their pile, you can just Diplomat and copy that card. It doesn't actually affect their cards, it just turns your Diplomat into a Mercator. Now this, again, factors into the give and take mechanic of this game. If a player is purchasing cards from the available personality cards, and that's a better version of a card or a card that you don't have, it's not like you have to go out and purchase it on your own. You can just wait for them to play it and then Diplomat to copy it. Same thing if you're going out of your way to purchase these valuable cards so that you have access to them. You can't stop other players from just Diplomat copying that card anytime that you use it, assuming they have their Diplomat available. So it's a give and take thing. You can't help yourself without allowing somebody else the ability to also benefit from that. Lastly, we have the Tribune, and this is how you pick your cards up. You play the Tribune, and then pick up all cards from your discard pile, including your Tribune. You're then going to count off three cards and gain one money for every card after that. So from your starting hand, if you did this, you would gain four, assuming you hadn't purchased any new cards. As you add more cards to your hand, you're going to be gaining more money every time you Tribune. Now, you can Tribune earlier in your hand rotation. For example, maybe you play the Architect card to move and build, and then realize immediately after that that you'd love to do that again, you just needed more moves. Well, you can't Architect because you don't have another one, but you could Tribune, pick that card up, and then on your next turn, Architect again. The downside is you wouldn't get the full benefit of Tribune because you wouldn't get any additional money from playing it. Now, there is a second part to Tribune, which is optional, and it's something you want to try to keep in mind. Uh, whenever you play the Tribune, if you have it, you can pay one food and one tool from your storehouse back to the pool. And if you do so, you can take one of the colonists that is taking up a slot in your storehouse and add them to the board on Roma, whether it be a ship or a, a land faring, uh, you know, a walker. 
Um, so that's a way to get them off of your board and onto the map. There are other cards in the actual uh, personality cards that will come out, such as the colonist card, that sort of allows you to do this at will. Um, but the starting off, the only way to do it is the tail part of the Tribune card. Other than that, you're basically gonna play it to get a little extra money and to reset your hand so that you can keep going. Now, this continues around the board until one of two things has happened. Either a player builds their last storehouse or the last of the personality cards is purchased, meaning no deck left and no cards on the board. Whenever either of those things have happened, the end of the game has been triggered. The player who triggered it will gain the Concordia card, which is a bonus seven victory points at the end of the game. Uh, each player then gets one more turn to try to do as well as they can and sort of, you know, edge towards victory, and then the game ends. The first thing you're gonna do at that point is you're gonna take any resources or any goods that you have on your storehouse and you're gonna convert them into their money value. So you end up with just a big pool of money. Then you're going to take all of your cards and you're going to separate them by the god printed at the bottom. All of your cards, your starting hand, and the cards that you've purchased have one of six gods printed at the bottom of them, bottom of them and each of those gods scores victory points in a different way, which is listed on your reference card. So sort your gods by Vesta, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Mars, and Minerva. Going top down, and the only card that you can't gain more copies of, uh, because they, it doesn't appear on any of the personality cards, is Vesta. You're going to gain one victory point for every set of 10 money that you have. So you're going to take your victory point tracker, and you're going to move it around the tracker on the outside of the board, one per 10 money that you have. Then, moving on to Jupiter, you're going to gain one victory point for every storehouse that you've built, other than those in Brick Cities, because Brick Cities are just too easy. So say you build a total of 11, um, and they're not in Brick Cities. Uh, you then multiply that 11 by the number of Jupiter cards that you've accrued throughout the game. So if you've accrued a total of three Jupiter cards, that's 33 victory points, 11 times three, and you'd move your tracker along the victory, board, uh, the victory track. Then Saturn. Saturn is one victory point for every province that you have at least one house built in. There are a total of 12 provinces on the Roman side, so that's a total of 12 points you could get from that times the number of Saturn cards that you have. So maybe you have two, that's 24 more points. Moving on to Mercury, it's two victory points for each type of city you have at least one house in. So if you have at least one brick city, that's two points. If you have at least one food producing city, that's two points and so on. There are five different goods. So the most you can get from that is 10 times the number of Mercury cards that you have. So say you have three of those, that's another 30 victory points. Mars is two victory points per colonist that you got onto the board. You have a total of six available colonists. If you get them all out, that's 12 per Mars card. Again, if you have two of those, it's another 24 points. Lastly, we have Minerva. Minerva works with specialist cards. Specialist cards allow you to activate all cities that you have a building on, a building, a, a storehouse on of a certain type. So all of your brick cities or all of your wine producing cities. Um, Minerva cards score victory points unique to that type of city. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but say for example, it's three per brick city because you bought the, the Mason card, which makes brick cities spit out bricks. Um, three per city of that type that you have a storehouse on. And again, you would add those victory points to the track. And lastly, again, if you were the player who ended the game, you get the seven victory points from the Concordia card and whoever has the most victory points wins. Now, let's get into a review of this game, things I like and things I don't like, and I will say I do really like this game. Uh, starting with Theme and Immersion, I'm gonna give it a solid two there, because I like how historically accurate the board is, I like that you're dealing with the traditional names of these regions and these cities, the map looks very traditional and like it might be from that era. It can look a little muted and plain at first, but it really fits the theme. Um, I like that even the lettering that they chose to go with is semi-Latin, like U's are actually written as V's, in this alphabet. Um, it can make it a little difficult to read upside down because now not only are you reading a region by a name you don't recognize, but it's in an alphabet that looks slightly weird, but you get used to it pretty fast. So I'm gonna give it a two for theme and immersion. Uh, for cost versus quality, this game costs about $65. It's got a lot of wooden pieces. It's got a huge map. It's got tons of replayability because you randomize the city tiles, which randomizes the region bonuses. You shuffle up your deck. It changes based off the number of players that you have. And there's also a lot of expansion um, capability for this game. They have several different boards that you can buy that have zoomed in regions of different parts of the Roman Empire. You could get a Britannia map. You can get a Germania map, a Hispania map. There's one for the Ionian region. There's one for the Cretan region. Um, there's one for the Ottoman Empire. So yeah, lots of availability there. But even in the starting box, I think you get your money's worth. Um, so I'm gonna say it's a solid, uh, solid two for that. Um, moving on to ease of use. 
Very simple game to work with. Not a lot of fiddly pieces. Everything that you need to interact with is very easy to work with. There's a couple things that you'll find annoying, like trying to fit all of your starting colonists onto Roma. But once you move out from there, it's all very easy to work with. Nobody's stretching or trying to reach piles of beads or you know rolling dice into things, which is knocking them over. None of that. So a solid two for ease of use. Moving on to enjoyable. I think the game is very enjoyable. I don't think you could really get frustrated with it or annoyed by other players' actions because nobody can really negatively impact you. In fact, most of the time you're going to be accidentally helping each other. Um, and you're really in pretty full control of your actions because you're always just choosing a card from your hand to play. And even if you want to reset your hand, you just play the Tribune card and you get all your cards back. So you're pretty much in full control all of the time. So I don't see how you could really get annoyed by that. There's a little bit of thinking involved, but it's really not that deep of a strategy that you have to go into to get a good feel for the game and to have fun with it. So I'll give it a two for enjoyable. And for teachable, I don't think you could get much more teachable than a combined three pages of rules, uh, with most of the rules being recited on the actual cards that you use to play the game, so that you don't even really have to memorize anything. The two rules off the top of my head that I can think of that you have to sort of keep in mind are the fact that you can't stop on the same segment as another colonist, and you have to pay a multiple of the coinage when you're building a house on a city that already has a house on it. That's pretty much it for things that aren't printed on cards. Um, even, you know, endgame scoring is sitting in front of you the whole time, or how much it costs to build on a location, or, you know, everything is right there for you. So it's very easy to learn, it's very easy to teach, it's absolutely teachable. Uh, give it a two for that. So going down the list, I think we've got a real winner here. We've got a two for theme and immersion, we've got a two for cost versus quality, we've got a two for ease of use, we've got a two for enjoyable, and we've got a two for teachable. Solid 10 out of 10 for Concordia. I really enjoy this game. I would absolutely recommend it. If you're looking for an entry-level Euro game, I feel like this is easily within the realm of something you could jump into even if you and your group don't have a lot of experience. If you're looking for a game that you can play over and over again, this game fits that with no problems. Even if you're looking for a game that's got a little bit more strategy and depth to it for a more experienced group of players, you could absolutely get that out of this game. You're just gonna play it with a little bit more aggression than other players might. So I would definitely recommend giving Concordia a try, picking it up if you can. Maybe even picking up some of the expansions if you really like it, I think I plan to. Um, so I hope you guys have enjoyed this review. Uh, if you have, I hope you can go down below, click on subscribe and click your notification bell, set it to all so that you get posts anytime or you get notified anytime I post a video. Um, if you want to leave a like or a dislike, let me know what you thought about the video. And if you have time, leave a comment so we can chat down below. I always enjoy talking to you guys and having in-depth conversations about things either related to the video or not. Uh, just happy to talk with you guys. Um, so yeah, hope you've enjoyed and I will see you in the next one. Have a good night.